So auto CPAP, and we'll come back to this wake business. Auto CPAP as a concept is very simple. You all know that when you had your sleep test, you went into the lab, you had a diagnostic portion where they established that you had the disease. Then they probably woke you up, put CPAP on, and you had the second half of the night or whole separate night or multiple separate nights where they titrated the pressure. And it became very clear from some work that several of us did about 10 or 15 years ago, because I was one of those who was a big advocate of this, that it would be nice to automate that last process. So have a machine kind of continuously say, how much CPAP do you need? Let's give you just that much. And if you don't need it, let's take it away. And if you do need it, let's put more on. And that didn't have to be a constant number. It could have changed throughout the night across the, you know, the, the different nights. And it'd be nice if the machine did that for you. And various machines come up with ways of asking that. Because the CPAP machine, because it's connected to your breathing, it knows what you're doing. If you attach a computer to it and somebody has the smarts to write a program, it can figure out whether you need CPAP or not. And they do it in different ways. In the early days, they just looked for an apnea, a blockage, a stoppage of breathing. In some machines, it looked for snoring, which was a mild degree of apnea. We developed the concept of flow limitation, which is a specific analysis of the shape of the signal. But the bottom line is all the machines do the same thing in a different way. They ask the question, do you need CPAP right now? And when the answer is yes, they raise the CPAP. So if you're not treated, it goes up. The big problem, of course, comes in if the answer is no, you don't need CPAP, what should you do? Well, one approach is to say, well, if you don't need it, take it away, right? And again, the idea is lowest at all times. If you only go up, everybody's going to end up on maximum CPAP eventually, because the machine will make a mistake and there's no way of recovering. So you have to have a way to respond to, no, you don't need CPAP, gotta, gotta lower it at some time. And the question is, when you lower it, are you maybe causing a problem? Because if the person is perfectly treated, he needs 10, you're at 10, you test whether he needs CPAP, the answer is no, he doesn't need CPAP, he's treated. So you lower it to nine, but he needed 10. Now you've caused a problem. It's very much like having a partner, a bed partner, and you're complaining about being unable to go to sleep, and every three minutes they jab you with their elbow saying, are you asleep yet? Are you asleep yet? Right? So, so you can see how this could cause problems, and one of the early concerns was that it would cause problems. The benefit, of course, is that when you wake up or when you roll back from your back to your side, the machine can detect that you don't need CPAP, it'll go down and now it'll say, oh, nine's good, yeah, eight's even better, seven's even better, six, oh no, you need six. And then you roll back on your back, it says, no, six isn't enough, seven, eight, nine, goes back to 10. The idea was it would adapt to you, and so it was called auto-adjusting. It was potentially a revolutionary approach to things, and the question is, did it help? Did it help people more comfortable? And did it do it without a price of making their treatment less good? And the answer, unfortunately, to both questions is no. There is no study that I am aware of that showed that people use their machine more if it was an auto-adjusting. There are, of course, isolated people who love it and say it's better, but that's true of almost every treatment we compare to another. There's some people like one, some people like the other. If the numbers are about even, then we're forced to say it's by chance or it's a placebo effect or, or it's individual populations, but we don't know who they are. And so the issue is, I'm not aware of any place where people show that auto-adjusting CPAP was more comfortable and therefore more worn. It's about the same. It's as good as, it doesn't seem to have any harmful effects, but it's hard to show that it benefits any. What it does do is it avoids the sleep study in the lab, and that's why it's being used more and more, is that it's a pretty good way to get your pressure once you have your diagnosis without having to go in the lab again. So if somebody lets the machine work, It'll come to more or less the right average pressure, which we could then convert into a single pressure or leave you on the machine. There are many different approaches. People are currently studying whether that's good enough. Unfortunately, no machine is perfect. If it makes mistakes, it's got to be detected. No technician is perfect either, but they make less mistakes and they're under more sort of supervision by recording everything. The auto machine, there's no record of what happened except the final result. And so there's a, a growing field of trying to monitor the machines, look at the data again afterwards, make a decision about whether you agree with the machine. It's not an area that's fully resolved. We're still working on it. But the, does, yeah. Does the, uh, when you're at, let's say, 10, you're at 10, you put it, say, well, the age on your 10 is good, so that's just going to be stay here. 
Well, they could stay that. In fact, some of the early machines did that. It said, because it knows it might make mistakes going down and going up, it would say, whenever I'm happy, I'm just not even going to ask any questions for five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour. And that's where the machines are different. Each machine had a different algorithm. In the early days, the machines that responded too fast, and I include the one that we developed, were all over the place, constantly. You couldn't figure out what was going on. Some of the other machines waited an hour before they responded. And you know what? They looked exactly like CPAP. They would get to the right pressure and they would stay there. It was just exactly like a CPAP machine, uh, not an auto machine. So I can't answer for one, but the, the, the compromise between the need to stay where you're at a good place and the need to correct for being at the wrong place is what the technology is all about. That's what the companies try to understand, maximize, what the scientists try to give them information on, and what experience shows. The bottom line is, to my knowledge, even the most widely used machine has not been able to show a very big difference in the average use of a large group of patients. It's about five hours, and if you compare a group with CPAP and a group without, you get five or six minutes difference in the amount of sleep time. It's, it's not, and many studies show nothing. So, it hasn't fulfilled that holy grail of saying, let's convert everybody who uses CPAP for five hours into a, somebody who uses CPAP for eight hours. That's what we want, okay, and who's happy doing it, okay? I can tie you to the bed and make you do that, but that's not going to last very long. So that's really what auto CPAP was about. So this is just an example of an auto machine, okay? And they're all slightly different, but this is one of the ones, it happens to one, be the one we worked on, but they all work on the same idea. CPAP. It decides everything's good, and it does that by looking at this shape of the breathing. If it's round, that's good. If it's like this, that's bad. And so what it does is it lowers the CPAP by a tiny little amount. It sees that there's a change from round to flat. It says, ah, got to go back up. And that's what it's doing continuously. It does this almost all the time, and we found out we were waking people up, very much like that elbow in the ribs that I talked about. So we did exactly what was suggested by Anita, and we said, let's when we're in a good place, let's sit there for five minutes before we test again. And there was a lot of jockeying about how long to wait. The problem was, when you rolled over onto your side and you didn't need CPAP, you wanted a reaction right away if this is going to work. When you're lying on your back and you're just well treated, you want the reaction to happen an hour from now. How do you tell the difference? Okay. So that leads us to SenseAwake, and I, again, my disclaimer, this is something we developed. We worked with Fisher Paykel. I've just come back from three months in New Zealand working on this, and so I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I want to convince you that there are some interesting ideas out there that may or may not have an impact. So think about it this way. The ideas are generic, the implementation is not. As we said before, when you're awake, you don't need CPAP. That's one of the things that makes us call it sleep apnea, not awake apnea. Okay? There is a disease which is awake, but it's a different disease. So when you're awake, you don't need it, and you could theoretically remove it completely. Interestingly enough, I don't think you're uncomfortable when you're asleep. You're uncomfortable when you wake up. Right? I think most people, when they're asleep, aren't actually uncomfortable unless it wakes them up, which it takes a lot of discomfort to do. But once they're awake, it's very hard to go back to sleep. And if you're in a cold room or a scratchy bed or if you have pain in your shoulder or whatever, it's very hard to go back to sleep when you're uncomfortable. And so the idea was, what about if we change this idea of auto CPAP to say, whenever you're awake, we won't give you CPAP at all. We'll take it away. And whenever you need it, we'll provide it much the way the autos do. That was the idea that motivated us. Now, of course, it's hard to do that if you don't know when somebody's asleep and brain waves and so on can't be monitored every night. We don't have any technology to do that. So it wasn't a simple thing of just saying, are you awake or are you asleep? We had to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm.